The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. Well, this is the completed coffee table. As you can see, it's a circular coffee table with a glass top. It has an internal shelf for displaying some of your favorite objects. We've also incorporated a feature a push rod that helps you to lift up the glass panel so that you can easily remove it to change the objects or to clean the top. Construction of this project is pretty straightforward. Now I did make this out of a tiger stripe or a curly red oak. Picked it up at my lumber mill and the construction of it does require you to get used to working in the round. And there's several different aspects of how we're going to create circular or curved panels to make up this project. And we're going to get started with these rails. Now these rails are going to be a lamination. And of course we're going to show you each step on how to make those. To make the laminating form I started out by ripping some 3 quarter inch MDF. It's 12 inches wide, 21 inches long. And I got four pieces because we'll need to stack those together to get enough thickness to cover the width of our rails. Now setting up the routing operation is actually quite simple with a circle cutting jig. And of course we show you how to make that over in the time saver section. I'll start the explanation with the router. We've installed a one inch carbide router bit and we've set our circle cutting jig up so that we're 13 and 5 eighths of an inch from the far side of the router bit to the center point on our pivot pin. We're making this radius a little bit smaller than what's required, 14 inches at the outside, and that's to allow for a little bit of spring back when we release the rail from the form. So that sets up our router bit, and then the depth, we just take a number of passes, about a quarter inch at a time, working our way through the material. On one of the form pieces, I drew a center line, and then I marked the outer edge of our radius, and then the inside edge of our radius. I then clamped on three blocks on my workbench. Actually two of them are just a clamp and then I put a piece of wood in my bench vise. And those will act as locators so that we can bring all four of the boards in and locate all four of them exactly the same way on these three points. Now to set the position for our pivot point. I took a framing square, lined it up with the edge of the board, and of course along our center line, and then I very carefully measured over that same 13 and 5 eighths inch distance to the center point of our hole, and that sets up our pivot position. And I clamp that to the workbench. Now it's just a matter of taking a series of cuts. Now with them clamped together and lined up as best as I can get them, what I want to do is drill two quarter inch holes all the way through the stack. I'm not worried about if it's perpendicular or anything, I just want to drill all the way through. And I'll do the same on the convex pieces. Now what we'll be doing with these quarter inch diameter holes is I'll be tapping in some quarter inch diameter dowel. And that will help hold everything in alignment while that glue sets up. Now we just apply a bunch of clamps and let that glue cure. 
Now that the glue's had a chance to cure, what I'm going to do now is take some coarse sandpaper, this is actually an old belt sander belt, and just even up the surface a little bit. Now if you remember, we took a one inch router bit and milled out that slot. And the reason for that is, we're going to apply a facing material. In this case, it's a, a cork, and you can pick this up at your home center. Just look over by the uh, bulletin boards and the whiteboards and so forth, and they'll have this material on rolls. And what we're going to do is glue this to the curved faces on each of our form halves. And what that will do is even out that clamping pressure. Now to glue it in place, I'm just using standard yellow woodworking glue, and then I'll tape it in place until the glue has a chance to cure. Now you can cut this cork using a straight edge and a sharp utility knife. Cuts very easily. The final step in preparing our form for use is to wrap this packing tape over the cork and that will help prevent the glue from sticking to the cork. Now I've got some nice curly red oak here and that's what I'll be using for the outer layers of my lamination. To resaw the stock, I've set up the bandsaw for resawing. Let me show you how. Here at the bandsaw, I've installed a resawing blade, and this happens to be a very high quality one, and it's been working very well. I also have my resawing fence, which is nothing more than a guide block that's spaced about an eighth of an inch away from the blade. And then what I'll do is I'll steer my board along, staying along my layout line that I put on the edge of the board that we're cutting. Here you can see the finish that we got from that resawing blade. It actually cut very quickly, and it gave me a really good finish. Now this finish should probably be okay for going right into a glue up. However, I do want to make sure that at least one of my faces is very smooth, and that would be the exposed face. After the resawing operation, I like to take and pass my board back through the surface planer, thus ensuring I got a nice smooth surface. Now if your surfaces are too rough from this resawing operation, you can plane the stock if you use a backer board. That's just another thicker board that you would place your material on top of and pass through the planer. Or if you've got a wide drum sander, that's a nice efficient and fast way of cleaning up the surfaces. To rip my lamination down to its appropriate width, I'll be using my bandsaw. I just moved over my resaw fence, lowered the guides down, and it's a real easy cut. And I'll stack them all together here in the compound miter saw and cut them off to about 20 and a half inches long. Well, I'm getting ready now to do my first glue up or my first lamination. Now the first thing you'll notice is I'm not using yellow woodworking glue. Actually, I'm using a liquid hide glue. And the reason for this is that hide glue has less chance of creep. Now creep is the function of a couple of boards that are glued together, say in this case these two boards were glued together and then under load they're allowed to shift from one another laterally. Now in structural applications creep is obviously very important because if you've got a laminated floor joist or a laminated beam you don't want those layers in that lamination shifting from one another. Well in our case we don't want this a curved rail to start flattening out over time and that would create undue stress on our cabinet or our coffee table. So a liquid hide glue is a very good choice for this application. Now make sure if you've got your wood selected for grain and so forth that the outside of your lamination is into the female portion of your form. And now comes the hard part. Compressing this in a little ways until you can get a clamp on there and then just start tightening up the clamp. Make sure you clamp it up good and tight and with this polyurethane or liquid hide glue you do have to let it cure in the clamps for much longer than standard yellow woodworking glue. In fact I'll leave these clamped up for about five hours before I remove the clamps. So that means this project's going to take a few days. Now we need to clean up one edge of the lamination. The joiner is a great tool to do that. While it certainly is possible to rip a curved board over at the table saw, I find it safer to do it here at the band saw. The 
cleanup pass at the joiner will smooth out that surface. In order to cut off our curved rails to their appropriate length and to machine this groove that will receive the field panel, we're going to need a jig. I've already gone through, ripped it to width, cut it off to length, and then carefully laid out some locations on it. Now our next step is to carefully position one of the curved rails on there according to the layout lines, which again are shown in the drawings that we provide. And then I'm going to glue these three blocks in these positions. And those are there to help us not only with clamping while we do these machining operations, but also for locating. Getting ready now, I'm going to start cutting off the ends of my curved rails. And of course, I'm using that jig we just built. Now I've got a stop block at this end to help position everything. I've swung my saw blade over at 40 degrees, and now I can cut off the left end of each of the rails. Getting ready now to cut off the curved rails to their proper and final overall length. As you can see, I've moved my stop block to the left side of the blade, and I've swung my blade around to 40 degrees this way. Now when I load my workpiece onto the jig, I've got to make sure that this left edge is lined up perfectly flush with the left edge of the jig. Now that we've shown you how to cut the groove, let's take a moment to explain the setup. As you can see over here, we've got that same jig that we use for cutting off the rails to their proper length. We install the rail so that it's flush at both ends. We also clamp the rail using these end blocks and a couple of clamps. The jig is also clamped down to the workbench surface. Then, using a framing square, I carried the center line position down along the workbench and marked it using a piece of masking tape and a pencil line. And that tells me where to move my pivot point in this axis. Then using a tape measure, I measured from the outside edge of our curved rail to the center of our pinhole location. And I set that at 14 inches. Then I set the distance from my pivot pin center point to the outside edge of my router bit so that it have an eighth inch distance from the outside edge of the rail to the outside edge of that groove, leaving an eighth inch wall there. Then with a quarter inch router bit projecting a quarter of an inch, we can machine that groove. The curved field panels look fairly easy to make. However, be aware, there are some tricks you're going to need to know to make these panels successfully. Making the curved field panels is actually much more complicated than it looks. Now at first glance, you would think that you'd just take your quarter inch plywood, kerf the back, and that it would become very pliable. And that's actually a very popular practice. However, in every case, and we checked our records that we've done it in the past, the grain was running in this direction, or opposite our kerf cuts. And that works out real fine, it's very flexible. However, in the case where we need our grain running vertical on our, our field panels, we cut our kerf this way, and then when we try to bend it, it just breaks. And of course, the break is following the grain. So we tried the next step. We tried soaking it in water, and then holding it over a form to see if it would hold shape. That didn't work either. But what we did find that works out very well is to take those kerf cuts, equally spaced about an eighth inch across and nearly halfway through the material, or approximately halfway, and then to glue on these ribs after soaking the plywood for about two or three hours so that it would become very pliable. Now these ribs will help hold the form or the curved shape, and it will distribute the, the forces in the plywood away from the weakest points. So, at being glued in place, the plywood is conforming to that shape and the, the stresses are equalized across the length of that rib. Cutting the ribs was very easy. The layout was very simple. Just created a series of radius layout lines. Then we took it over to the bandsaw, cut it up, following very closely with that curve because that will establish the outside radius of our field panel. Then we just cleaned it up a little bit on the belt sander so that it was smooth and even. Then we 
take our field panel after kerf cutting it, and again, those kerf cuts are an eighth inch apart and about halfway through the material. Soak the plywood in water for about three or four hours. And now what we'll do is we'll apply glue to the ribs and then very carefully clamp the assembly together and allow the glue to dry. The legs for the coffee table are made out of one inch thick stock. There's quite a bit of machining on them, and of course we'll show you each of those steps. I've already got my leg blanks cut to length, planed to thickness, and ripped a little bit wide. I'm going to be trimming up these two outer edges a little bit later. The first operation I want to do is to bevel the face of the leg, and that will help to create the curvature that we need. To do that, I've set my saw blade so that I've got 15 16 of an inch distance between the fence and the blade, and I've tilted it over at three degrees. For the next operation, we need to take a bevel cut off of each edge of the board at five degrees. We want the outer edge to be an overall width of two and a half inches. So I'm going to take my time and balance out those two cuts. Now we need to machine this groove along both edges of our legs. And to do that, I've installed a quarter inch diameter router bit in the router table, raised it up a quarter of an inch, and set it a quarter inch away from the fence. I also marked on the fence the leading and trailing edges of the router bit because we are making a stop cut. So what I'll do is I'll bring the piece down, and I've got a reference mark on my piece, drop it down on the cutter, feed across, come to the end, and then lift up and remove the workpiece. Our top is going to be held on to the frame using pocket hole screws. We'll drill two pocket hole screws in each of the upper rails and one pocket hole screw at the top of each of the four legs. The top is made up of eight individual pieces. The technique for making the round top is pretty straightforward, but there is quite a bit of machining. And of course, we'll show you those steps. The material for the top is made out of three quarter inch oak and I've ripped it to about four and three quarter inches wide. Now what I want to do is cut off each of the segment pieces that'll make up the top. I've got my saw swung around to 22 and a half degrees for my first cut, and then I'll rough cut off each of the pieces. Cutting off the segments to their proper overall length does require a little bit of care and attention. Now one way you can double check everything from your outside edge coming in towards the center area of the segment, draw a line parallel to the outside edge an inch and a quarter in. Now the distance from where that line meets up with our previous cut over to where our new cut is, that should be 11 and a half inches. Now if your board is four and three quarter inches wide, the distance at the outside points would be 12 and a half inches, maybe a little bit strong on that. So that should help you with your setup. Now I've set a stop block to ensure that each of my eight segments will all be the same length. With everything cut correctly to size, all your joints should be nice and tight, and the diameter, so to speak, across the flats, should be 30 and a quarter inches. To reinforce this butt joint, I'm gonna be using number 20 biscuits. Now I do want to be very careful as to where I cut the slot and position the biscuits. On this inside edge, remember we're going to be machining a rabbit in here, and that's roughly about a half inch wide rabbit. And we don't want the biscuit to show on the outside of the radius, so we do have to be very careful. So I'm going to be positioning mine about two and a quarter inches up from this inside point coming up this way. Make sure you get glued down in each of the biscuit slots and across the faces. Then get your clamps on there 
In this case, I'm using a band clamp. Draw it up good and tight. Push it down. Make sure you're sitting against your surface flat. You want to, of course, do this type of glue up on a flat surface. Check the inside points along each of your segments. Make sure that they're all lined up properly. And then just let it dry. And of course, we'll let this dry thoroughly before we do any machining. Well, now you get an idea of how we're going to be making our top round. Of course, we're using our circle cutting jig with the router. Now, because we're cutting all the way through, I've clamped a backer board against my workbench. I then took my top using double-sided tape and attached that to the backer board. Then I attached my pivot point, very carefully centering it up into the center of our top. Then I set my radius from the center of the pin to the inside edge of the router bit at 15 inches. Took a number of passes to cut away the waste. Now I'll adjust the radius and cut the inside diameter. Using the same setup, I've adjusted the radius so that we can machine the rabbit that will receive our glass top. I've set my router bit depth this time so that it's only cutting 3 eighths of an inch deep. Using a quarter inch radius roundover bit in the handheld router, now I can go ahead and round over the top and bottom faces of the outside edge. The coffee table incorporates an internal shelf for displaying your favorite objects. It's made up of three basic components. Making the shelf in the upper ring is pretty straightforward and only requires a couple of steps. I started out again with a piece of scrap on top of my workbench. Using double faced tape, attached my half inch birch plywood, which I rough cut to about 26 and a quarter inches square. Using double sided tape, I attached that to this piece of scrap material. Mounted my pivot block in the center of our piece. Now what I want to do is set the distance from the inside edge of my router bit to the center point on the pin. Get that set correctly so that I'm going to be cutting a 13 inch radius. Then I'm going to be using a quarter inch diameter router bit. And that's going to be very important. Not necessarily on this step, but on the next one. Now my first task is cut out the outside diameter of our upper ring. Taking 3 16 or an eighth inch deep pass around each time works out about right for that quarter inch diameter router bit. Now we adjust our circle cutting jig so that we're from the inside edge, the pivot point being in this direction, 12 and an eighth inches away. And this cut will create both the ring that goes at the top of the shelf and the base that goes at the bottom of the shelf. Now it's just a matter of getting it up off that double sticky tape and being careful not to break that ring. The sides for the internal shelf also need to be pulled in at a curve. Now I want the good face to be on the inside, so I'm going to curve the back side. Now because this piece is roughly about 80 inches long, I don't want to be taking 8 inch kerf cuts. So I've installed my 3 8 inch stack dado head cutter, and I've set the height of it so I'm a little bit more than halfway through the material. And then I'll space these kerf cuts about 3 8 inch apart. With our internal shelf cut to size, I've taken that, placed it on top of my workbench, and then taken the top of the coffee table and centered it up very carefully on that shelf. Now what I need to do is lay out the locations where we want to drill the 3 quarter inch holes and the 1 17 64 inch hole. Now what I'm doing is going through and fitting my shelf sides to that ring that we cut earlier. And what I've been doing is placing it inside the ring, getting it to fit tightly in there, and then marking the location where I need to cut it off. And then I trim it up at the compound miter saw. Now that I've got it fitting inside the ring, I want to make sure that it'll fit around the shelf bottom. And right now it's just a little bit too loose. It's loose on the bottom, tight on the ring, so I'll trim it up just a little bit smaller. Now with everything fitting up good, we can assemble the ring, the shelf bottom, and the sides. 
I'll start by applying a thin film of glue around the inside diameter. Now we can install the sides, again being careful not to break it. And now I'll tack it in place with some half inch brads. Now I'll go ahead and place glue around the outside diameter of our shelf. And now we can place the ring with the sides on top. And I'm going to line up my seam on the side with the hole in our base that is 1764 inches in diameter. And that will give us a little clue from the top side which one is our lifting mechanism. And again, tack it in place with some half inch brads. The lifting mechanism for the glass top is made up of three simple components. You'll have some quarter inch oak dowel rod that you'll cut off to its final length during final assembly. Then we have to make a handle and I made mine out of an inch and a quarter diameter oak dowel rod and you have to do a little bit of turning on it. Then that goes into the larger 1764 inch hole and then there's a keeper and the purpose of this keeper when the table's upside down, or right side up, I should say, the keeper will prevent the handle from falling out. And then when you go to lift the glass up, you'd push the handle upwards, and that would lift the glass up. Making the keeper is really simple. Start out by ripping the stock to its appropriate width. Then at the bandsaw, I notched away the clearance area and then cut it off at the compound miter saw. To make the handle for the push rod, I'm starting out with a piece of inch and a quarter oak dowel rod. It's just a scrap that I had laying around and of course you can use anything. I then drilled a quarter inch diameter hole from the back side to the appropriate depth and I just laid out the locations on the sides of the piece. Now we can chuck it up and turn it. Using a gouge, I'll start out by first truing up the surfaces. This end will actually serve as the area where we push up on it to lift the glass, so I'll shape it nicely to fit the hand, slightly mushroom shaped. As you can see, I've just laid out the locations where the deep recesses that we need to cut away and then the opposite end or the top end of the handle. Using a parting tool, now I can cut that deep relief area. When we join the rails to the legs, we want a 1 8 inch reveal between the leg and the rail. The leg should stand proud. To join the legs to the rails, we're going to be using number 10 biscuits. When cutting the biscuit slots on the curved rails, I find that the biscuit joiner was a little bit more stable by referencing the inside or the concave face. When switching between cutting the biscuit slots and the rails and your legs, be sure to adjust your fence over so you get that 1 8 inch reveal. After a little bit of sanding to round over the outside faces of the legs and to clean everything up, I then went through the process of fitting up each of the components and going through a complete dry assembly at this stage. This is one of those projects where you don't want to skip the dry assembly stage. I've got everything fit up real nice now, and now I'm ready to go ahead and do the final assembly. Now I will warn you that assembling all these components will take some time, so I highly recommend either using a liquid hide glue or perhaps even a polyurethane glue, something with enough open time so that you don't have to rush. Now I should point out too that I did have to clip the ends of the biscuits. All I had to do was bump them up against the disc sander and that provided the clearance around the edges of our plywood panels. The plywood panels only need to float in the upper and lower rails. 
and I'll be applying a liquid hide glue in each of the biscuit slots, getting that spread around nicely. Now, of course, when assembling your rails, make sure you have the ones with the pocket holes going down. We are assembling this upside down. And working our way all around, coming right back to the starting point. Band clamps make an excellent choice for clamping together something round, such as our coffee table. Pull it together good and tight, and check to make sure all of your joints are drawing together. A little bit of twisting and wiggling on the legs sometimes helps. And the last step is to check and make sure that our coffee table is in fact round, and you would know that by measuring across two of the rails, and they should be the same distance. And we're right at 28 inches on both of them. We'll let that glue set up before moving on. In order to have enough clearance to gain access to the pocket hole screws in the rails, we're going to need to notch away a little area right above each of the pocket hole screws on that rib. So what I've done is I'm just taking my driver bit, placing it in the pocket hole with a screw, and then marking the location. Then using my rotary tool, I can grind away that clearance area. And that should do just fine. Well, I spent the last few hours detailing everything out, doing all the finished sanding and so forth, because we're pretty much finished with construction. So now what I want to do is start the finishing process. Now the interior shelf for my coffee table will be finished simply by spray painting the inside surface black. Now, of course, there are a variety of options that you can use. For example, you could line it with felt, or a quilt, um, stain it. There's just a wide variety of interior uh, treatments for that. Now I prefer the dark color because I think it creates a sense of mystery. So this just simply gets spray painted. For the rest of the project, I'm starting out with a medium reddish brown aniline dye. Now this dye is alcohol soluble and I find that Using one of these foam brushes makes it very easy to apply and you have very little chance of getting blotchiness or even lap marks. You just brush it on good and wet. Then what I usually do is let it soak for just a second or two and then I wipe off the excess. Now that the alcohol dye has had a chance to dry thoroughly, we can move on to the next step. I would like to point out though that if you uh, find that you've got little dark rings around some of the porous areas on the wood, those dark rings are caused by the alcohol dye weeping up out of the pores of the wood, and then it puddles up around those porous areas. To clean that up, just take a rag with some alcohol on it and wipe down the surface, rubbing lightly or firmly, and that will remove those rings. So now we can move on to the tongue oil. Now I'll just brush the tongue oil on, making sure I get the surface coated very wet. After it soaks in for a few minutes, wipe off the excess with a dry rag. For the top coat, I'm applying about three to four coats of an oil and urethane wipe-on product. It provides plenty of protection and it's very easy to apply. Simply apply it with a lint-free cloth, wetting the surface, and then you even up the surface or the texture by using the same wet cloth, wiping with the green. Between each of the coats, I'll sand lightly with 600 grit sandpaper. And now it's time for some final assembly. I got started by drilling some clearance holes for the screws on the flange of our shelf. I then took the top, centered it up very carefully on the shelf, and installed three of the, the dowel rods, and that helps everything with alignment. Now I'll flip it over and tighten up the four screws that hold the shelf to the top. The screws that I'm using are number eight by one inch long sheet metal screws. Thank you. 
Now I can go ahead and glue the three decorative dowel rods into the base of the shelf, and I'll do that by applying glue to the dowel rod and sliding it up through the holes. Now when I get it up near the top, I want to make sure that the dowel rod is just flush with our rabbit or a little bit below. The first step in installing the push rod and keeper is to make sure that the push rod is the appropriate length. And I did that by holding my keeper to the bottom surface of our shelf and pulling the keeper down so it hits on our flange. Then at the other end, I carefully marked the location of the push rod and cut it off to length. The keeper gets held to the bottom of the shelf with a number 8 by 2 inch long screw. So I've gone through, counterboard, and drilled through the keeper so that the screw, when it's tightened all the way up, will only project out the backside about 7 16 of an inch. Now what we can do is tighten that in place. No glue, we want to make sure that this is removable should we have to replace any components. With the pocket hole screws already set in each of the pocket holes, we can now take the frame, place that over our shelf and top, and center it up very carefully and tighten up the pocket hole screws. Now the next step for your coffee table is to go around the house and find some objects that are very special to you and place them inside the coffee table. Next, take your glass top and install that. And the push rod makes installing the glass pretty easy, as well as getting it out. Simply push up on the rod and pull the glass top back out. Now this glass top I picked up at a Pier 1 import store. Being a standard diameter, you can find these glass tops very affordably at a wide variety of supply stores, such as craft stores and interior decorating stores. Well that wraps up this project of our circular coffee table made out of tiger stripe oak. It's a lot of fun to build, there's plenty of challenges in it, and the results are just outstanding. Thanks for watching, I'm Chris Dayhut. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.